Hey, hey, welcome to Film Fanatics, three film geese discussing movies both new and old. My name is Dan. My name is Justin. And I'm Joe. This week, a disappointing box office take for Exodus, Gods and Kings, but is it a disappointing movie? Chris Rock tells us about his top five, and we review yet another underground horror movie with The Pyramid. We have two home media movies for you as well, Radio Free Albemuth and After the Dark. Our triple feature of older films is The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, Listener's Choice Old Classic Christmas in Connecticut, and Oscar-winning Best Picture, The Apartment. Our top five this week are final in the series uh, looking at the best of the last five years. We tackle sci-fi and fantasy this time. Before we get started, though, uh, we need to talk about this item that we touched on a little bit last week on the show, and that is the interview pretty much right after... We had talked about this movie and what's going to happen with it. There's terroristic threats. Everything just went crazy. <laughs> Sony pulled the movie. You know, a bunch of theater chains aren't weren't going to run it. And then everybody was upset about it and back and forth, back and forth. And then for days and days, you know, it went ranged from Sony's never releasing this movie anywhere in any country on any format to just not in the U.S. to just, you know, not... In theaters, but they'll do it on DVD. So now it came uh, earlier today that we are going to see this movie in very select cities on Christmas, and the selection is based on basically independent theaters that want to run it. I guess first things first, how it, how does this look for Sony? Because to me, I mean, they were very adamant about not doing anything, and then. You know, even people as big as Obama said, like, they made a big mistake in, you know, caving to the pressure and they should have released it. Um, to me, I think it makes them look a little bit weak because obviously they're doing a complete 180 once they realized everyone was against them pulling the movie. So, Joe, let's go to you first on that. Well, I think that it it's like I said before, it's really a tough spot to be in because... I mean, you don't show the movie, okay, or people might be upset about it, but with all the threats going around, if you did release it, it makes it look like you don't care about people's lives, mm -hmm. which people were bringing up too. Um, I'm actually glad that uh, people as high as the president did dispute it, you know, don't give it to terrorists and freedom of expression, that sort of thing. So I think it's a good thing that it's released maybe carefully, uh, but uh, I think it's, it, hopefully it'll blow over. I, I do understand though it might look them seem a little weak. I think that in terms of a lot of their decisions lately, they... They just be really confused about where they stand in mm -hmm. terms of what their fans want and what uh, viewers want. And some uh, of the leaked emails kind of confirm that. Yeah, a, a lot of a lot of the different plans they have are, are definitely questionable. So it doesn't look very good for the image, but it's still unfortunate how it happened. It's it's not fair, uh, and I actually do hope that they continue to release it and they they do kind of buck up because people actually want to see this movie, and I think that financially speaking and for their image for them not to release it would be bad oh yeah. i think at this point they should use it to their advantage and roll with it maybe carefully but i think that if they approach it safely this movie could still be a good way for them to kind of actually bounce back from it mm -hmm. uh, what about something to the effect of because i think this would be a very poor taste but knowing hollywood i could see this happening doing a new promotional campaign for the for the rollout you know with something like I don't know, the most dangerous movie in the world or the, the most, movie, you know, hey. some people didn't want you to see. Or what, you know, does that make it look like well, a the, cash grab based on terrorism? The funny thing is, I feel like they were kind of asking for it, though, because, you know, months before any of this happened, people were already saying this True. is controversial. We have a movie that's a comedy that is basically saying, hey, we want to kill a leader of another country that we obviously don't like and we have a lot of tensions with. So... You could argue about whether or not they should have released it anyway, but the cat's been out of the bag for a while. Mm -hmm. You want to go controversial? You were banking on that. Now you you get what you want. It's like, come on, don't cave into it. You're really getting what you want. This is the most controversial movie. That is true. Justin, your thoughts on all this? Well, to give you a counterpoint to that one, Joe, before I get to my actual thoughts, movies all over the place beforehand were taking shots all over the place at North Korea. G.I. Joe, Transformers, Olympus Has Fallen, all basically attacking slash demonizing... North Team America. Team and Team America, one of your lest, favorites. Lest, lest we to forget, to yes. That one. Yeah, true. <laughs> and, I mean, I feel like eventually we were going to have it coming to us. Is it a shame that it was this? Absolutely. But I'm completely with you, Joe. I feel like they should definitely play into the controversy because people who didn't want to see this originally are on board now. Yeah. And they really, really need to capitalize on that. They should embrace it. 
I mean, I was looking forward to it. I, I'd be upset if they didn't show it. Like, I actually have friends that were excited about seeing this. And mm-hmm. if anybody... I love Seth Rogen. It, I was excited about it. Yeah, and if anybody in North Korea, and it's not the people, obviously, <laughs> right. you know, so it's some people in the government are upset about it. If they do take it personally as a threat, you know, whatever, honestly, I couldn't care. You know, if, if they want to really blow things up over this, I mean, it's it just shows how ridiculous and petty people over there are who are in power. If they're mm-hmm. making a big fuss about a movie. A movie. Well, and the upswing for Sony is that, you're right, people that had no intention of seeing this movie or don't even like Seth Rogen or James Franco, uh, if they're upset politically about it, will go see this movie. To just support to, it. They may, they may not even go see it. They may just go buy a ticket and then go see a different movie, but Sony will still make the bucks off it, you it, know? It's become a movement now. <laughs> right, exactly. You're right. So uh, we'll, we'll see how it shakes out. I mean, m- my guess is that they'll release it on Christmas Day, like like we said. Nothing will happen. And then probably within the first week or two of the new year, mm-hmm. the big theater chains will uh, will say, sure, let's, let's run the interview. Mm-hmm. So we'll see. All right, we have a lot of movies to get to this week. First up is Exodus, Gods and Kings, which uh, took in a very disappointing $24 million. It did open at number one still, but uh, it's certainly not what they expected. And Justin's going to tell us about Exodus. After defying the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses, played by Joel Edgerton, Moses, played by Christian Bale, is sentenced to exile in which he receives a, quote, message from a higher calling. Returning years later, Moses demands Ramses free the 600,000 Hebrew slaves he has at his control, or suffer the consequences. Unlike most, I, I honestly applaud the different interpretations of biblical stories. I thoroughly enjoyed Noah. Joe and I re- reviewed The Last Temptation of Christ. I think there's really a lot to go off of. However, with this version, my biggest issue is the fact that director Ridley Scott takes the spiritual component out of it almost completely. God is almost treated like a hallucination, and it honestly begins with an incredibly unlikable Moses for the better part of the first hour or so. The action sequences are good. The acting, for the most part, is passable. I thought Bale was a little was pulling a little too much of a Batman at times. And honestly, the production qualities are really impressive. But like many of Scott's more recent theatrical releases, I know we've talked a couple times about whether or not The Counselor would have gotten better as a director's cut, but this also feels really slashed up as well. It's just a real mixed bag, and I give it a C-. minus. Joe, what would you think of Exodus, Gods, and Kings? Well... My favorite biblical tale is that of Moses and his journey. I think the Prince of Egypt is a fantastic portrayal of the story, bringing the epic scope, but with a believable, complex human character. And all these characters are shown as being Middle Eastern, by the way. The Heston version is not quite as dynamic as this one, and balancing the relationship between Moses and Ramesses as the DreamWorks version. But it has the amazing amount of scope, and the acting is amazing as well, and really brings the story to life. The reason I'm discussing these films is because you should see these two rather than waste your time with the Scott version. It's dull both visually and performance-wise. The script has the template, but doesn't take any real time to develop any of its characters, and as Justin mentioned, the main one is mostly unlikable for most of the movie, being a series of events rather than a fully-fledged story. Plus, the film is tinted dark, taking away the majesty of the desert and making it even harder to stay awake. I do think the costumes and sets are great, and the actors do their best, but this movie would probably be a little higher if the main characters were just a little less white than me. <laughs> give it a D plus. Yeah, I, I mean, it, I thought it looked pretty good. The 3D is great. The CGI, though, is terrible. Like, the cinematography is great, but then once the plagues start coming and stuff, mm-hmm. just, oh, it's bad. Uh, I think Christian Bale is good here, but I feel lately that he's a little bit overrated He's not amazing here. Justin, it's funny you mentioned Batman. I was getting American Hustle flashbacks from time to time with this character. Just the way he said things, you know? Also, it's beyond long. Nothing interesting happens for about an hour. And when it does, it just sort of comes in fits and spurts. But the biggest crime that this movie has is the two biggest money shots Moses has is parting the Red Sea and delivering the Ten Commandments. (laughs) We see the Red Sea dissolve. We don't even really see it dissolve, but it dissolves. It drains. It drains. Yeah. Um, And we see him drafting the Ten Commandments in the last scene of the movie. 
and then riding it to the mountain. Oh, that's rough. But neither one is in this film, and, and I just don't understand why you would tell Moses' a story without those. They also kind of left out the crucial "Let my people go" and the snake. You know, another from the classic. Stack. You know, <laughs> that's cool special effects right yes, there. Another classic. Um, so I give it a D plus as well. Other than Prometheus, I have not been impressed with Ridley Scott in a long time. Actually, uh, I was looking through the list because we were talking about it. Mm -hmm. Other than Prometheus, I have not really liked the movie he's done since Gladiator, to be completely honest. Yeah, and that's 13-some years ago by this point. Uh, 14, yeah. Right, yeah. It's sad. I mean, obviously Alien. One of the best. One of the the great sci-fi movies of all time. And Blade Runner. And Blade Runner, yeah, I, I have not seen, but obviously everyone loves it. Yeah, the guy... You know, had some talent, but... Oh, um, yeah. In abundance. Not just the last decade, it's been kind of lacking. Yeah. He's definitely been, like, hit or miss. Though, definitely right now on a missing streak. Yeah, I agree that, that Noah... I mean, I didn't, you know, like it as much as you, Justin, but way better than this. Much more interesting, at least. Yeah, much more well, interesting. Th- Russell Crowe, I think, was more dynamic. Well, I think that Justin led a good point, though. Even though it was trying to tell a more fair interpretation, it still kept the spiritual aspect. It still told the majesty of the story. It added something different. I mean, you had that interpretation with the characters of Noah. You had the creatures. Right. Something different, something new. The new spin while keeping true to the main idea. This one... Everything was absent. It was literally just the basis of there. But really, it was practically Son of God level. You're right. I, I feel like if, um, you know, church groups that enjoyed movies like Heaven is for Real, you know, went to go see this, I, I think they would be very disappointed. Well, it's not really at anything any new, so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, at least God's Not Dead was something new, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. All the wrong reasons. <laughs> hey, it's more memorable than this. I will remember this for the wrong reasons. I mean, I think one of the most iconic film scenes of all time is Heston parting the Red Sea. Yeah. You know, and that was in in a time when CGI was non-existent. You know, every special effect was done manually in, you know, different ways. And I read about how they did that, and it was really interesting. But, I mean, with all the technology that he's trying to utilize in this movie... Just crazy. You, you couldn't do something? Yeah. That's that's the most disappointing thing is I, I was looking forward to the plagues and I think I don't know, it's just the stylistic tendency. I, I brought it up before. It seems like really uh, I think I think Nolan's probably one of the, the big offenders of this, but it seems like every movie now is tinted darker. Mm. And if you're gonna yeah. have a movie that takes place in the desert, why is it every scene that's even in the middle of the day dark? It is true. It's just it's just really annoying. Every I understand some scenes maybe, but mm-hmm. every scene yeah. it doesn't look right. There's got to be some consistency. Yeah, I, I just, I don't know. I think that it's one of the few times where, okay, if you want to literally make a darker film, fine, but you got to make <laughs> There's something a time and a place. You know, make the beauty of the desert stand out. There's that majesty. It's devoid, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, other than the great sets and the great costumes, I mean, this movie just does not have much to offer. Uh, not really, no. They, they need to spend more time building up their characters, and maybe they would have added something. That was another big thing that bothered me a lot with this one. It just felt, everything felt really, really rushed. I agree. And it's like two and a half hours I long. I know, which is another thing that bo- <laughs> bothered me that like nothing happens for an hour because there is a lot that's supposedly going on. There's stuff happening, but nothing's right. really developing. Exactly. No, it's, it's, it's really confusing for like the first for the first couple of minutes trying to trying to <laughs> decipher what exactly is going on, mm-hmm. even though the story is pretty well known. And that's a problem, right? If you're messing up a f- extremely well known template, maybe you're trying too hard in the wrong area. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, and I felt I personally felt like some things were underutilized. Like Moses, as a general, was underplayed because his relationship with God made God seem kind of incompetent <laughs> sometimes. I don't know. It was, it was yeah, I didn't really understand weird. the portrayal of God in this, to be honest. I mean, I guess they were trying to say he was less omnipotent than typical, but mm. even so, at, at the most frustrating part was at some point they were having a conversation where Moses says, "You have any ideas? Do you need me?" You know what? No, I don't. Just watch. Stand, <laughs> yeah. stand back and watch. I'm like, well. Thanks. This this character's pointless then. Right. Why are we following Moses? Right. That's that's you know, if you're doing a story about Moses, you gotta develop his character and make him important. Mm-hmm. Agreed. All right, well up next is the Pyramid, and Joe's gonna tell us about it. The Pyramid is an American supernatural horror film directed by Gregory Levasseur and written by Daniel Mearsand and Nick Simon. Oh, it had two writers. <laughs> the film follows an archaeological team attempting to unlock the secrets of a lost pyramid, only to find themselves hunted by an ancient creature as well as other hidden dangers that you'd probably find in a tomb. 
This movie is one of those unique quandaries for me. There isn't really much about it that works. As a horror movie, it offers one or two decent scares. The story is basic, but has potential to be interesting. Sadly, the film offers annoying cardboard cutouts of characters who are so annoying that you'll be hoping they'll die soon. <laughs> Not good for any story, least of all a horror one. Played by horrible dialogue and beyond questionable logic, you'd think this movie would have nothing to offer. That is not the case, as the acting is so hammy and the plot so contrived that it's actually pretty entertaining. Sadly, some decent practical effects are often cancelled out by less than average CGI. For some impressive ideas and never getting boring, I'm actually going to award it a D. Wow, that's a bit surprising, <laughs> because this movie is a train wreck. Uh, it's easily the worst horror movie of the year, in a year marked by particularly bad horror features. I mean, everything you said. The acting is horrible, the situations and the lines are laughable, nobody makes any smart decisions. Nope. And for found footage, some of the scenes had parts that weren't found footage at all, which was really annoying. It was extremely inconsistent. <laughs> yes, it was very inconsistent. This is the kind of horror movie... Where you're exactly right, Joe. About 20 minutes in, I wanted everybody to die. <laughs> because then I could leave and, and go home. No, seriously, if we didn't have to watch the entire movie for the show, I, I would have walked out. It's oh. terrible. It's an F. Justin? <laughs> well, it gets more concise than that. Yeah. <laughs> Just in December, when I thought I would be safe from any more <laughs> terrible, eye-gougingly bad movies of this year, out comes the pyramid. Acting's laughable, effects are incredibly B-grade, and the story is truly all over the place, sometimes being weird, hammy adventure, and then other times really tacky horror. It's not even remotely fun in terms of campy, it's just entertainingly bad. <laughs> I had more fun watching it than I did watching As Above, So Below, but it's an absolutely dreadful piece of cinema. I also give it an F. Question, though. Who did you watch As Above, So Below with? No one. Right. And who did you watch The Pyramid with? Well, you two were The collective. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, obviously, that's going to be a little bit of a f more fun experience if you're comparing bad movie to bad movie. That's you true. Know? I mean, I didn't think As Above was bad, but obviously you gave it an F, so you did. But, yeah, th this one just... Oh, my goodness. This movie was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was. Uh, I mean, so was Exodus at points. Well, <laughs> uh, the most disappointing but... thing about it for me, though, was that uh, we were kind of promised Christmas mummies, actually, I thought, with this one. Th yeah, that's what you guys were going into it thinking. Well, I, I didn't I thought know about pyramid that. pyramid horror movie mummies, right? But yeah, you would instead, think. We won't spoil it, of course, if you decide to see mm. this film for some reason. Please don't. But yeah, there are no mummies. We actually got Christmas mummies in Exodus, if you're looking for that. <laughs> actually, that's true. <laughs> when it comes down to it, we did. Wow. Oh my I didn't think of that. If you'd think they'd be more likely, you'd get your Christmas mummy yeah. movie and not the one you should see. Well, and but... I feel like <laughs> no. you know, these, these guys were trying to, like, like Justin said, it sort of flips um, genres a little bit. And they mentioned Indiana Jones at one point. I feel like they were trying to, like, do some kind of Indiana Jones thing. Uh, I don't know what they were trying to do. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I like I said, I think there was potential. Like, the actual... Reveal, so to speak, is kind of interesting. Though, to be completely honest, they're totally ripping off Stargate. Mm, a little bit. Uh, okay. They're going extremely literal with it. But so I kind of did like that. There, I saw some potential for something interesting. It didn't really make any sense because what they're afraid of happening to them wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing either way because the end result's the same. Right. But, you know, whatever. I, <laughs> I just thought... There is something kind of unique about it. I will admit, if I saw it by myself, I'm sure it wouldn't have been as enjoyable, but it's just so terrible. It's just one of those movies for me that it's just hilarious watching these yeah. people and some of the lines for these characters. Like, I don't know how I'm supposed to feel about well, any of them. What's interesting is, you know, a lot of these kind of movies, you have maybe a couple of different groups that know each other. You know, in this movie, it's father-daughter. And then, like, reporter and cameraman, cameraman, cameraman. and uh, who, who kind of know each other, but not, not really. I mean, they and work together a little bit. And there's a daughter's boyfriend. And the daughter's boyfriend, who, you know, the <laughs> dad doesn't like anyway. So it's like, none of these people really are close. are close, 
I mean, except for the father daughter, kind of. Except sort of, they're kind of biting each other's heads off. Right? They yeah. they kind of hate each other too. Well, what I well, didn't. The cameraman get. is little, is quite possibly the most likable character. Uh, Something's wrong. I don't know. I cared more about the robot. I liked the robot. No, although it reminded me of when uh, of the robot that they use in Titanic to look at the mm. uh, yeah the rubble. No. Well, they got it, I guess, from that set, maybe. Maybe. But I, I didn't get the dad. He was trying to sabotage his own digs half the time. Oh, you're using technology? Yes, he was. I want to pick at it. Get away. We don't want to, like, make money off this documentary. Yeah, that didn't make any sense I, either. I didn't understand that at all. No. One, one of the many frustrating things about the pyramid. Indeed. All right, well, up next is Top 5, and in this film, Chris Rock plays Andre Allen, a former stand-up and comedy star known for a series of films called Hammy, where he is dressed in a bear costume. Now four years sober, Alan plots a comeback with a slave drama and upcoming nuptials to a reality star that are documented for Bravo. The entire film takes place over a day where he is followed by a New York Times reporter played by Rosario Dawson. Top Five's terrain isn't exactly new. For one thing, his character's entire career trajectory practically mirrors that of Tracy Morgan's in 30 Rock. Ironically, Morgan shows up as a friend of Andre's in this film. But other than that, much of the commentary surrounding issues of celebrity, media, public perception, and alcoholism have been tackled as recently as last month's Birdman. But Rock's spin on it is his own and does touch on some different aspects. It also throws a couple of twists our way and has some fun celebrity cameos. And it is genuinely funny. Uh, He also has kind of a scattered eye in regards to his directing. But Rock's always had an original voice, and the script by him does help elevate the less original concepts of the film. I give it a B. Joe? Well, I just have to say it's great to see Chris Rock back. I mean, he has honesty. And I think that in this film, the drama actually works well, perhaps better than some of the comedy. This serves as Dan said a parody and a reflection of his own career and the entertainment industry. It focuses on the downsides of celebrity and creativity in a more direct way than, say, Birdman. Mm. But it really works well for the most part. As much as I love Rosario Dawson, and especially in this film, the romance element doesn't seem to work perfectly here. Rather, it seems to kind of bog down the main story, which is actually potentially great, and that's mostly Chris Rock's. I'm not saying that the comedy should be dropped altogether, obviously, but it does distract from some of the best moments, the more dramatic ones. Uh, For instance, the flashback is more jarring than strong dialogue in the film, which is more naturalistic, which is between primarily Chris Rock, Rosario, the conversations, just more human, believable, down-to-earth comedy. Mm. Perhaps her character is not utilized as well, but it could just be that some things are underdeveloped about her. For instance, we find out she has a daughter, and that's pretty much a throwaway. This lack of balance between them lessens the final punch of the movie. Had their story gone a little further, it could have been a much stronger film. Still, overall, it was pretty enjoyable, and I also give it a B. Hmm. Justin, what'd you think of Top 5? In an all-but-stale age of romantic comedies, I really gotta be grateful for movies like Top 5. It tells a focused, engrossing story that explores not only relationships in general, but also the wildly manipulative world of Hollywood, quote, reality. It has some hilariously, though sometimes disturbing moments, but ultimately gives a fascinating perspective of a stand-up comic trying to be something else and not getting any respect for it. I feel like sometimes the comedy doesn't always work. I think some of the vignettes are a little unnecessary. I disagree with you on the whole daughter aspect. I thought Rosario Dawson's character has a really good arc. I wish there was a lot more with them and a, and a little less of some of the other people that aren't just aren't necessary because we see them and they never come back. But I really, really enjoyed this. I give it an A minus. I have to say, I don't think of it as a romantic comedy. There was romance in it, but I mean, there's romance in most of the movies we see. I do think of it more as a, a an either straight ahead comedy or straight ahead drama with comedic elements or dramatic elements. That's how I looked at it. Yeah, I mean, the the romance was there, but I agree with Joe. I don't think that that was the strongest part of the film. I don't know. I thought it was I thought it was focused. I feel like the distractions to other things got, got in the way a little bit sometimes. But I think the general component of how it develops and and how it comes together works works rather well. Okay. And, and I, I don't think Joe necessarily disliked the daughter part. No, I just... I think he was saying there wasn't enough of it, and they didn't do anything with it. They kind of did near the end without giving spoilers, A but little bit. I felt like they're, they both could have actually had more time to develop their characters. The okay. movie kind of ends suddenly, which mm-hmm. is one thing that kind of bugged me about it. I, know I disagree it was, with that. It was supposed to be cute, but I felt like the movie could have easily used another 10, 15 minutes. I don't know. I was, I was content with the way they just wrapped things up, honestly. 
I don't know. Is I, it is it was it a little safe? Maybe, but honestly, I w- I was okay with it. It it worked well within its logic. It made sense. It gave hope, but it also didn't didn't spoon feed. Maybe the ending isn't necessarily the problem, but everything that happened before then, maybe cutting back on some of those more standard Chris Rock in your face stuff to actually mm-hmm. keep the main story stronger. Mm-hmm. Like I liked his journey. Mm-hmm. I felt like they were trying to keep the balance between the two of them, but I didn't think it was quite as well balanced with Dawson's character. Like I said, maybe cut away some of the time, give us more about those characters. I wanted more. I'll and you know that. me, when I want more, that's a good thing, but sometimes I need a little more to establish it. I think personally his journey was the best part of the movie for me. I thought it was the best developed. Not oh, yeah. not not perfect, but definitely could have added a little more, but almost there. Hers, I felt like there was a lot going on with her character. I didn't feel like it was all on the table. Did it have to be? Maybe not, but they literally threw like five different things in there, and there's a lot you could obviously explain. And they talk about. did that a little bit with Chris Rock's character. We're not supposed to... I don't think we're supposed to know everything. I feel like that's one of the really interesting things about about writing a character is... You have to let them have their have their privacy. If you just lay it all on the table, the magic's gone to some extent. Maybe not. I mean, you know, like do did we learn everything about Reagan Thompson and, and Birdman? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, but I feel like if you allow us a little more as the film goes on, you can still have some mystery. I mean, some characters obviously there are big reveals where we learn a lot about them. So really, you could take it either way. I feel like Chris Rock's character was pretty well established and i think we did know a lot about him i mean what what more was there really i mean it's all pretty much out there on the table i think it's more dawson's character we're talking but i mean we have this contrast of rock who's this character who's sort of the counterpoint to the whole hollywood reality and then we have his wife who puts everything out on the table him we get we start off not knowing much but we still learn it through little bits we don't I'm sure there are other things we could have known, but I don't feel like we need to know everything. Well, and I think the same can be said for Dawson's character. In terms there was a time the, and a place, and we got what we needed. I, I think the same could definitely be said a lot more for Dawson's and Rocks. We we find out very little about her as we go along, and then Boom. a lot. With him, I think we know a lot pretty much the whole time. Um, but the one thing I will say is that the side characters that sort of come and go, like his posse, his buddies. I could live without them. I, I could live without them, and it's a shame because that's sort of the whole reason the movie's called Top 5. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and, and that whole scene could probably be excised. The see, scene. see, there's a piece of Chris Rock's character we didn't really necessarily need. We didn't need all, his whole family di- or friends dynamic, but we see the J.B. Smoove character, which is his, like, publicist, bodyguard, yeah. whoever. We see him. And then we see father. the father. Yeah, that was telling. That's enough. And then and then that's enough. And then we we you know get him and Dawson together. I feel like if you threw those characters away, you could have spent more time on either Dawson's character or the relationship or her and her daughter. All of which I think were a little lacking. I feel like some of them worked. I feel like a couple of them were definitely overkill. We definitely didn't need the full extremities that was the uh, first flashback i think that would have sufficed in just being divulged in a interview conversation well that's kind of one of the big issues i have with the movie i thought that was funny but it was my least favorite part of the movie overall Mm -hmm. like i really liked the actual human dynamic i liked the conversations i liked exploring the characters in a semi-serious manner with the comedy derived from just the lines just the comments that's what Chris Rock does best. Well, and, and that's what I meant when I said, you know, he has this kind of scattered eye with the directing. I don't think we needed the flashbacks at all. We could have taken them out. You know. And maybe that's the thing, Justin. It's not necessarily that I didn't like what was in the movie with the characters already, but you could have easily taken those scenes out and added more time to flesh out some other elements to make it better. I don't think they should have excised them completely. I just feel like they should have, like, taken one or two of them that were that would have done so much better with context and highlighted those. Or they could have interspersed Because them. honestly, if they had just went like straight up focus on the conversation, just steady cam it, it'd be a before ripoff. Well, no, I'm not saying it has to be but all But yeah, that. I don't think we're saying that. No, but like, for instance, they could have interspersed it. Like, they had him basically doing overviews and talking over the flashback and then have the whole flashback sequence basically separate. You could have interspersed with actual conversation, kind of like frame by frame. Mm-hmm. Could have made yeah. it a little more interesting and keep us in the story as opposed to kind of temporarily putting us into a different movie a couple times. Right. Mm-hmm. All right, up next, uh, we actually have two home media moments for you this week, sort of uh, trying to play catch-up here the last few weeks of the year. 
uh, with some that uh, we might have missed. And first up is Radio Free Albemuth, and Joe has that one. Radio Free Albemuth, which comes from my dad, uh, is an American film adaption of the dystopian novel by the legendary science fiction author Philip K. Dick. His works have been adapted in such films as Blade Runner, Scanner Darkly, etc. The film was written, directed, and produced by John Allen Simon and stars Jonathan Scarf, Shea Wiggum, and Alanis Morissette. You might like her, Dan, I don't know. Oh, I love her. The story is set in an alternate reality, America circa 1985, under the authoritarian control of President Fremont. It makes liberal references to the collected works of Philip K. Dick throughout the film. Berkeley record store clerk Nick Brady, played by Scarf, lives modestly with his wife Rachel, played by Catherine Winnick, and their infant son. Nick has been experiencing strange visions and dreams. He confides in Rachel and his best friend, science fiction writer Philip K. Dick, a fictionalized version obviously, played by Shea, Nick calls the source of the visions Valis, standing for Vast Alien Living Intelligence System. The visions encourage Nick and Phil to begin a secret mission to start a revolution to overthrow the oppressive regime using subliminal messages in music. The film, like the novel, deals with Dick's highly personal style of Christianity. It further examines the moral and ethical repercussions of informing on trusted friends to the authorities. Also prominent in Dick's dislikes of the Republican Party, satirizing Nixon's America as a Stalinist or possibly neo-fascist police state. This film does follow the story generally, but it is really a vessel for various themes and tropes for Dick's work, serving as kind of a love letter to the author. Wiggum is the standout here for me as being an excellent representation of the author, with the look and sound being more than a mere imitation. Scarf does okay as the protagonist, though some of the other characters are a bit wooden and don't sell the gravity of the situation. The story is silly, but does contain some intrigue having been adapted about maybe 20 or 30 years too late. The problem is that while it is being sold as serious, it seems bogged down by the campiness of the subject matter. I wish the tone had been more focused. It might have made it stronger if they had taken one direction or the other. And the film does drag on about 10 minutes too long, but it does lead to a good conclusion. I leave this one with a C+. Hmm. Justin, how about for you? Well, I mean, like you said, Joe, Philip K. Dick has been the source material for many a hit movie minority report blade runner studios have capitalized this and we get cheap mockeries like next paycheck oh, yeah, and paycheck's a bad one <laughs> and now radio free album Muth is another addition to the mesh it's a really interesting story but the big issue here is it's an incredibly dated story they i read many reviews saying oh yes this was super faithful but it's a little too faithful. It doesn't know how to adapt its stuff, and it already feels dated right out of the gate. The acting's okay. It's yeah. it's not bad. It's just there. The visuals are really, really campy. It's It was really underwhelming in that. And honestly, I thought it took a very, very long time to get going. I can and, agree. And when it finally does, it really becomes a big question of whether or not it was honestly worth it, yeah. despite the intriguing premise. I still think it's a really interesting story. I thought the overall concept of the, of the radio as a as a means to spread a message was really interesting. Mm -hmm. But it's it it's a concept that really needed updating if they were going to try and do it. I give it a C. I agree. It's definitely a little dated. It's uh, it's definitely a good representation of Dick's ideas, though. Well, I think it might be a little bit too much for the Dick purist. I, I know about a scanner darkly, but as far as his works go, that's about it. So for me, this was a little bit too inside baseball, <laughs> and I just, I mean, there's definitely some interesting ideas. I love the, you know, subliminal messages of music, obviously the connection to radio thing, but the effects are terrible. The acting is average at best. I will say the gentleman that, that played uh, Dick was, like, did a good job. Shay Wigum, he's, he's an underrated actor, yeah. and I, I, I don't know if you guys have actually heard or seen much of Dick's interviews. I watched a documentary mm -hmm. about him. This guy got him spot on. Is that right? So okay. if this is a love yeah. letter to him, I mean, like, I, th I thought he did a good job with it. He was good. Um, but I mean, when Alanis Morissette's one of your star players yeah. here, uh, you know, yeah. she doesn't do that great a job. I like when she sings. Her, um, yeah, that character's pretty <laughs> bad, honestly. But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I thought it was pretty forgettable. I actually give it a D plus. Oh yeah. Uh, it's interesting that you guys say that it, it's so dated because I didn't think about it in those terms. I thought the effects looked dated, but you're right. The whole concept is very dated post you know cold yeah. war the guys are standing for nixon mm -hmm. i mean they're talking about subliminal messages with cassettes i mean it's just right i mean it's just so imbued with dick's ideas that's the really the best thing about the movie right is you really get to see 
kind of purely what his mind was like. Maybe not the best story, but literally this is what was going inside the guy's brain. So he got a lot of cool ideas, maybe a little bit of nuttiness, but I don't know. That, that's probably the best thing about it that stands out for me. But I have to agree, the effects are kind of cruddy and it, it, it's a bit long and dated, but... I don't know. It, it had some good things about it, I thought. And I'll be honest, in the in an age of digital radio, iTunes, and other things like that, it could have really lended itself to a to an honestly interesting uh, modernization. Honestly, the general ideas are still there, but it's so stuck in the 80s mm-hmm. that if it had adapted a little bit, it might have been able to kind of flesh itself out a bit more, but I Do agree. you think it would have worked, though, because of the the Philip Dick character? Because obviously, if it was set now, I don't know if they would want to use him as a, as a template. It's kind of tough, because if they actually decide to take that character out of the story, they could, but he's a big part of the story. Right. So they could do that. They could just have you focus more on the protagonist, his internal conflict with his visions, and use that to maybe get the song out on iTunes or something. Mm-hmm. Easily adapted to it, really. You know, just change a few things. The problem for me is, that character was the best part of the movie. Yeah, you know right. he was the strongest part of the movie. Right. His narrations, his arc, the ending with him, like the last 10, 15 minutes, probably the best part of the movie when he's in the prison. The spoilers, you know. So you could do that. I could easily see that happening, but but why would you want to? Right. If they tried to do something like that, I honestly do feel like it would have been more likely to end up like a next or a paycheck. Okay. If it, you take out some of the dick isms, it kind of becomes less special. I don't know. Hmm. So yeah. the question of how much is too much. This was a little too much. I, I thought about all the little references to the different stories and songs and, uh, you know, themes were cute. But unless you're a hardcore Philip K. Dick fan, mm-hmm. it's not really going to mean anything to you. Speaking of songs, by the way, as a big 80s music fan, this song that they were trying to embed the subliminal messages into General folk. was terrible. Yeah. It, was, it would not be at all a hit on the radio, and so I don't know why they... Well, to be fair, from what I know about him, he died in the early 80s. Okay. And I don't know if he... I mean, he liked everything, I guess, but there was a throwaway line that the main characters didn't really like rock and roll that much. Right. So, I don't know. They were kind of out of touch anyway. Maybe that's part of the joke. But yeah, you would have wanted to put it in hair metal or something. Yeah, I just it wouldn't have been not Sheryl Crow esque sort of thing. Right? Yeah. yeah, not in the not in the early to mid eighties. The song no. was actually really yeah. bad too. So it, it, that's what I mean. Like it just well, that's that's part of the problem. I feel like in some ways it was sold as a parody, but some of it's supposed to be really serious. Right. So I, that's why I was confused with it. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, our second home media moment is uh, one called "After the Dark," and that's going to be with Justin. Mr. Zimmet, played by James Darcy, and his philosophy class have spent the semester tackling complicated ethical dilemmas and trying to come up with rational solutions. Though for their final class, Zimmet places each of his students in three separate apocalyptic scenarios in which only a few can be spared, and how that decision can be made in the presence of a wild card. This is a really bold idea with much disgust, and even though I'm not entirely sure it always works, particularly at the end, I feel like it definitely gets you thinking of what exactly does it mean to start again in a post-apocalyptic scenario. I'm not totally sure they need the really heavy-duty fantasy CGI sequences to illustrate this, but for the most part, it works and gives an interesting perspective, even though I'm not entirely sure if I agree with the way that they reach the conclusions that they do. However, this part of the review is disregarding the last 20 minutes of the film where it just goes horribly, horribly off the rails. It adds in completely ridiculous and unneeded plot points. It reaches points of just awkward comedy and adds in an entirely random subplot for no apparent reason. That was the worst part. It's a really interesting idea with a lot of setbacks, and I give this C-. minus. Yeah, I mean, I, I just I don't think it worked at all. Uh, it is an interesting concept, but it's better as a discussion with your buddies than a movie. Because what happens is, once they take it out of the classroom and get into the actual scenarios, what's the point? It's boring and ridiculous because none of it is actually happening to the students. They're just talking about possibilities of what might happen here and there. So there's zero tension because it's all pretend. The quote-unquote twist (laughs) is... Not only obvious, but uninteresting and moronic. (laughs) Um, It actually, Justin, reminded me a lot of, as you know, one of my all-time favorites, The Box. 
Oh, wow. Which, which I gave an F to. And the box also had a very interesting concept. If you don't know, it's based on a short story where the guy gives you a mysterious box, and if you press a button, you get a million dollars, but some random person in the world dies. Great as a philosophical discussion, as a movie, not so much. But at least in the box, the people were actually going through the scenario of the box. They weren't just sitting around a table talking about it. Uh, so After the Dark, for me, is a, is a D plus. I like the concept. The movie leaves a lot to be desired. Joe? Well, I'm actually, uh, I guess, the most generous here. Uh, I agree that the fact that everything is basically pretend does pretty much take away almost all the tension. I think that some of the fantasy sequences actually do kind of add some of it for me, like it kept things interesting. But after they go about it the second time, I th- felt that it started to get a little repetitive. I thought they did touch on some really interesting ideas that made you think. So for the most part, it kept me interested. But there are parts that we've just kind of lags. And the biggest problem is when it goes back to the classroom, it kind of sort of breaks the movie up completely. And then they they really added in this subplot about the motivations for why this is even happening, which makes the whole thing even just any realism in the actual storyline gets completely lost. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're talking in terms of professors and classrooms. It's God's not dead territory. It's I, like, yeah. I like, made that comparison like, as well. Like that's, in my head. That is not happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, and really just the motivations for what's happening and why. Not only was it incredibly obvious, it just it made the whole thing seem basically pointless. Any interesting morality and it was pretty much lost. But ultimately, though, I did like some of the fantasy sequences. I liked the ideas. I thought some of the acting was okay. You know, Ginny yeah, from, the acting was from all right. uh, Harry Potter was in there. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys noticed her. Yeah, there, there were a couple of decent people and in fake there. Fake Cumberbatch. Fake Cumberbatch. <laughs> but there were also uh, Discount Ethan Hawke. You know? Yep. But there were also some really bad actors, uh, oh, really, yeah. really too. So it was really, uh, Justin said it best, I think it's a really mixed bag. But I'm actually going to leave this one with a C. Mm. I mean, it, it had a lot of problems, but I can't say that it was a complete waste of time. I was about in that C type territory until the end. The end, uh, <laughs> the end is a disaster. <laughs> Just, yeah. Pretty much, yeah, the whole Pointless. subplot does does really hurt the movie. Mm-hmm. Watch until the very end of the last apocalyptic scenario, then turn it off immediately because it only gets worse in there. Yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty much if you could just kind of cut all those parts out, it would be a salvageable movie, I think. I, I don't know if they ran out of time to like do stuff so they're like, well, we don't want to do a fourth apocalyptic scenario, so we'll just... You know, do this part. Throw a bunch of random no- stuff in there. Yeah, that has nothing to do with anything, you know, except for the bizarre motivation behind it. Well, it they just were, didn't make any sense. Well, to be fair, that class was already running about four hours, so I don't <laughs> I know what kind of... I did think about that. Like, literally, I mean, <laughs> even, like, if they were going to go in-depth this project, this is, like, this is at least a day mm-hmm. yeah. you're spending in this, and I'm like, is this... Don't you guys have other classes? Nice school, by the way, though. On a yeah. tropical with island? On a tropical island with the doors open and everybody just hanging. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> so. great. And apparently it's a prep school. It's not even really college. Oh. Which I, I found. I thought it was college. Mm-hmm. So, so did I until they said oh, prep school. And I was like, well, I must that might explain that. the four hours then. Which which okay. kind of makes the yeah, uh, some... subplot a bit <laughs> worse, by <laughs> yeah, the way. that's true. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Creep factor just went hmm. up the peg. That's yeah. true. So I didn't think of that. Think about that, you know, so. This is, this is the kind of thing where, like, it, it would be interesting to talk about with a group of kids. You know, like. I could take this, you know, to to the kids I used to be with at the Y and, oh, hey, let's give you all little things and scenarios and it would be a great discussion. But just... I don't know if it's a movie. I don't know if it's a movie. (laughs) Maybe if they reworked it, there's potential for that idea. I don't know. Yeah. Well, the preview... I watched the preview beforehand. The preview made it look like... They actually were doing it. That they were actually doing it. That's what I thought. And I was like, oh, okay, this could be really cool and interesting and then it's not. I actually rewound the, the part <laughs> where they were first like going to the bunker, and I was like, "Okay, wait, wait, did I did I miss how they is this a ended flashback? up here? Because I thought it was real still." And then I rewound, and I was like, "Oh no, this is all just pretend part of the yeah. school and pretend." That I'll have to say, in terms of marketing, I don't know whether that's brilliant or horrible. Because I it mean, got me really interested yeah, in the movie. Yeah, it got me interested in watching it, but then it was a huge letdown once you watched it. Well, it was it. a flat-out lie. Right. That's yeah. what it was. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. true. Okay, well, uh, we are up to our top five. This is the last we're going to do in our series of the uh, 
top fives of various genres from the first half of the decade. And the only major category we haven't done yet, one of Joe's faves, sci-fi and fantasy. So we're going to be looking at movies from 2010 and up. And I'll go first on this one. Um, I have a couple honorable mentions. First of all, some of my top five action movies delved into the sci-fi range, like Source Code, Snowpiercer. So I'm not going to uh, really bring those to this list. Um, but I did want to give an honorable mention to the movie In Time uh, with Justin Timberlake. It was a very interesting concept. The movie was executed okay. Um, I didn't love it, but I liked it enough to sort of throw it a nod here uh, in our top five. Uh, my number five is Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. This is was a great follow-up uh, to the first film in the series. I'm really looking forward to seeing where it goes from here. We talked about this earlier in the year, and, and I would not be surprised if it showed up in my top 20 of the year. Uh, number four for me is Prometheus. This is uh, the one good Ridley Scott movie we can say uh, <laughs> from the last almost 15 years. Uh, uh, true you enough. Know. Yeah. But then again, taking some of the concepts we, he originated in the 70s with the Alien franchise and uh, sort of updating them. But just a, a really good movie. It's one that doesn't answer everything, and somehow that's okay for me. Uh, it's one of the rare times that you can sort of leave thinking, okay, well... I don't really know what that was or that was or what happened there, but I can I can get on board with it anyway. I'm still intrigued. Yeah, I'm still intrigued. Uh, number three for me is Limitless. This falls probably more into the fantasy part uh, than the sci-fi part, but yeah, um, sci-fi. I, I, yeah, I think it certainly got those some some of those elements. Uh, a really interesting performance from Bradley Cooper. It was one of the first times I saw him um, branch out a little bit from uh, what we had seen him uh, do in the past obviously this is before movies like silver linings and american hustle but a, a really cool concept that uh, was sort of borrowed again this year with uh, the lesser film lucy uh my number two is star trek into darkness love the first film second one not quite as good um but still had a lot of great stuff going on a lot of good action sequences um, you know, it, it definitely borrows a little bit too heavily from the already established con uh, film that came before with real Cumberbatch this time. Yes. Um, as real. opposed to James Darcy. <laughs> um, but <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I'm looking forward, uh, you know, again to this franchise and seeing uh, where it's going. And uh, again, the casting choices for the J.J. Abrams reboot have just been fantastic. Joe, we'll go to you next. All right. Well... My honorable mention is actually going to be Star Trek Into Darkness. I think that it definitely had a, a lot of entertainment factors, and I, I think it, it definitely has some strong action to draw people in. However, I, I do think that it's kind of going a little too far from the basis of Star Trek originally, so I can't really put it on my top five. Uh, my number five is so low on the list because it's actually borderline not sci-fi because it's supposedly very realistic, but it's still classified as a sci-fi film, and that's actually Gravity. You know, I thought about that. I wasn't sure if it counted or not. It's technically listed as a science fiction film because it does bend some laws, but it stays mm -hmm. very true. I guess you'd consider it hard science fiction. Mm. But in, in terms of the visuals, I mean, it's just fantastic. I think that it's kind of taking a really simple story but really saying a lot with it. I think that's that's just really impressive. Uh, number four is actually Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Mm. Uh, just really, you know, what can you say? Fantastic visuals, great story, kind of treading upon something that's already been done but adding something new to it. So it's kind of, you know, bring something fresh here. Number three is Edge of Tomorrow. Now, this obviously oh. can be marketed as, you know, action, but really, really, really original concepts and really gets you thinking, which I think is ultimately what science fiction is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Number two is actually kind of fusing the science fiction and fantasy elements, and that's actually Super 8. I think mm -hmm. if you can really bring about a, a story focusing on kids, you know, yeah. that's another fantastic one as well. And... Really, just, once again, kind of taking those classic ideas and bringing something fresh to the table. Well, I, I will admit, and, you know, this definitely happens for all of us from time to time with the top five, I totally forgot about uh, Live, Die, Repeat, Edge of Tomorrow. It, that, would, <laughs> that would easily be in my top three, probably. Oh, that um, terrible title. One, one of the best sci-fi or action movies. Oh, yeah, so Edge of Tomorrow this year. is uh, Live, Die, Repeat, if you guys got that yes, mixed up. It's, <laughs> sorry. It's sorry about Live, that. Die, Repeat. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, Justin, how about for you? I have two honorable mentions, if that's okay with you, 
you gentlemen. Well, my other one was Cowboys and Aliens, so. Well, naturally, right? <laughs> hey, I like it. You do like that movie. Nah, it's, it, it, it's fun. It's all a guilty pleasure kind of way. Go ahead. But uh, my first is Prometheus. Obviously, Dan, you said it best. Probably Ridley Scott's last really good movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. The only reason I it didn't make the cut for this was I was trying to make a pretty solid balance between sci-fi and fantasy for this list. Hmm. And my other honorable mention is Beasts of the Southern, of the Southern Wild. Okay. Very good movie. There are elements of fantasy in it, but as, little, uh, as we mentioned in our review a couple months ago, little limited. it's kind of sort of limited, so I wasn't entirely sure if it was appropriate. Definitely not limitless. <laughs> Definitely not <laughs> limitless. Fair point, Joe. But let's get to my list. Number five, Ruby Sparks. A strange yet fun take on the Pygmalion myth. Paul Dano and Zoe Kazan have great chemistry. And yet, despite the fun, it has some really dark elements in terms of writer's block, dealing with the hardships of a relationship, and just the overall concept of, of control. Hmm. Number four is Attack the Block. It's basically Super 8 meets a Clockwork Orange, and it's actually really good. It tells a, it tells a blockbuster story on an extremely low budget with a cast of almost unknowns, and it works. And I honestly wish there was a way to continue the story. Number three, Never Let Me Go. If Michael Bay's The Island was more dramatic and didn't waste everyone's time. Equal parts depressing dystopia story and heartbreaking character study. And although it's tough to watch, it was honestly the first time I considered Andrew Garfield a really talented actor. And number two is Midnight in Paris, the last great Woody Allen film. Tells a simple yet deep story that explores the human psyche as well as a gloriously authentic 1920s Paris. And I think if Alan had just left out some of the political commentary, it might have been perfect. Hmm. Um, I, I definitely went more of the sci-fi realm uh, than the fantasy. I actually debated putting Oz the Great and Powerful on the list. Because clearly that's a fantasy story. But I wanted at least some aspects of sci-fi in there. Hmm. So uh, my number one actually is Super 8. Ah. Love this movie. This is uh, really, when I watched it for the first time, it, it harkened back to a Goonies, Stand By Me kind of time where, you know, all of these completely unknown actors got together and just, it tells a really, really honest tale and it portrays children very authentically. And uh, the, the sci-fi element was great as well. Joe? Oh. My number one is actually Prometheus. Uh, really, uh, Ridley Scott, you know, I guess just stick with this, um, <laughs> really. But uh, just, you know, fantastic visuals, great performances. And as I said before in some of these other films, I think the important thing about science fiction is it utilizes the ideas of science and the fantastical elements to push the boundaries of the imagination, really to get people not only to think, but just to question basic morality through these tales. It's very important. I think Prometheus harkens back to these original ideas that sci-fi is supposed to do. It's supposed to make you think. And it does leave you asking questions, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think the best sci-fi does leave you asking a couple questions. It's kind of interesting this is a divisive film, but definitely the biggest standout in the last five years. Nice. Justin, what's your number one? My number one is her. That's sci-fi. <laughs> Spike okay. Jones never offers up the same experience, and that's a concept that I love. It's easily my favorite performance for not only from Joaquin Phoenix, but also Scarlett Johansson. And despite the quasi-creepy concept, it slowly becomes one of the most poignant observations about humanity's relationship with technology, as well as where it may be heading in terms of the future. And I think there's a lot to think about after it. You know, it's funny. That's a really good number one. I totally think of that as a drama, but it is very science fiction. I do fiction. too, but it is sci-fi. It's certainly fantasy. Yeah, it's 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 light science fiction, but it's, yeah. it's very important, though. That's, that's a good pick. Thank you. Well, next week's uh, top five will will return sort of to our more general top five format, and uh, we're going to do the most anticipated for us in uh, 2015, and uh, maybe take a look back at last year's most anticipated and see how they uh, stacked up to uh, what we thought of them. Uh, but for now, we're going to close the show with our triple feature of older films, and uh, that is going to include a listener's choice, Christmas in Connecticut, and a very Oscar-friendly film, The Apartment. Uh, which won Best Picture. First up, though, is our new classic, and that is The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, another uh, sort of fantasy-type film. Joe is going to tell us about it. 
Well, uh, Secret Life of Walter Mitty has been still playing Walter Mitty, who is a middle-aged photo developer who works for Life Magazine as it's being downsized to move to the digital age. Ben Stiller's character is actually fairly timid despite being surrounded by all the adventurous ideas of the big world around him, and on his last final mission for the final issue of Life magazine, he is told to find a missing piece of film for what will be used as the cover for the last issue, and he goes off an adventure across the world to find the mysterious photographer played by Sean Penn, while also trying to build up his, uh, is that an eHarmony account, so that he can build up the courage to win over Kirsten Wig, who works at the office. Uh, Walter Mitty is actually a really enjoyable movie. I think it's amazingly shot. I think that it tells a really true, honest story that has this really brilliant scope to it, but is still somehow very down-to-earth and believable. I think it tells a really good message, and I think that, on the whole, Ben Stiller is its probably one of his better-directed features. I, I was really very impressed with just the use of the cinematography and the editing and the music. I think it's pretty good. Admittedly, I think it does get a little overly sentimental at times, and that sort of bogs it down a bit for me. On the whole, though, I do like the messages and general ideas of the film. Uh, the only thing that really holds it back, though, is kind of the placement of the dream sequences. Because while they were served as kind of a hook for the film, and some of them are very entertaining, I sometimes feel like they are meant to be in a different movie. Not entirely sure that if we should have had more or less of them, or maybe just focus on a completely different movie entirely. Not saying they're unwelcome, but the one that sticks out the most to me is actually this one scene where he imagines that he's in a romantic relationship with Kirsten Wiig's character, with Benjamin Button. The reason I always bring this up is because I think that this is kind of really one of the best examples of why these sequences might not necessarily work, because it almost seems like a completely different movie. Benjamin Button is something that is, whether liked or disliked, is a fairly recent movie that some people might remember, but I think it leaves the film in danger of being dated, perhaps. Mm -hmm. If you leave some of these out, I think you could have had a stronger film. The actual story is timeless timeless messages, and it's just beautiful on its own. I don't think it needs to be left down by these cultural references. Still, on the whole, I think it's a very enjoyable movie and holds up pretty well, and I leave it with an A-. Justin? Well, Ben Stiller's never really amazed me as an actor. Taking on a project such as this as a director is really admirable. It tells a fun yet human story that, while I'm not sure kids will be entirely on board with, can still lend itself to some intelligent discussion for the entire family, Joe, I completely agree with you about the dream sequences. I feel like the spectacle ones are easily the best. The Benjamin Button thing's just flat-out awkward, to be honest with you. That's the worst one, for sure. Yeah, it, it has no business being there. But the movie as a whole, I think, is really proof that there is still such a thing in the modern day as a family film. It's a really good story. It's beautifully shot. I think there's a lot to like about this movie, despite some fairly noticeable flaws. I gave it a B originally. I'm bumping that up to a B plus. Okay. Well, that's good. That B was a bit harsh. I, I really wish this movie got more attention uh, upon its release at Christmas last year. Joe and I both placed it in our top 20 for 2013, and it really is just as good as I remember it. Visually, it is stunning. The story is outstanding. This was a short story that I read as, as a high schooler and really enjoyed, so I was excited when they were bringing it to the big screen, but you know, a lot of times with short stories, how much padding goes into it when it's a two-hour movie based on a five-page, you know, little short. But the comedy here is sometimes subtle, sometimes ridiculous, um, as in the Benjamin Button sequence, but usually it does work. And overall, it's just an uplifting tale. Stiller's keen eye behind the lens helps shape the story, and I really like the way that it blends the fantasy with the reality. Um, the only thing is that I think the kids might be confused a little bit by the fantasy sequences yeah. because of how they're framed. Um, especially the, the first one we see probably no more than a minute and a half into the movie mm. where he's um, waiting for a train and then all of a sudden you know goes into a burning building. And I, I'm not sure if kids will really be on board right away with it. But it truly is a, a great movie for all ages, and I give it an A. I think that Stiller really did a great job directing this. Definitely. Joe, when we did um, earlier this year, um, right before the Oscars, we did like our top five Oscar snubs. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned uh, that you felt Stiller could have gotten a director nod I, for this. I really liked his directing in this. I just thought that he utilized the the background so well for for the sets that he had around him, just for the nature shots. It was just beautiful, and I just I thought it was well edited, and I thought he had some really good direction for his actors. I thought he kept the story moving really, really well. It was very impressive. I think that 
Stiller doesn't get that much recognition as a director, and this was just a good example of that, I thought. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, And this is an example of a movie that we rarely see. It's a movie where really no character is pointless. There's not a lot of characters in this movie, maybe 10 or 12, but between, you know, Stiller's family and the the people taking over Life magazine and the people that he already knows from Life magazine, everybody has a purpose mm-hmm. and fills it very well. And it's also a movie where if you ask me to pick my favorite scene, I don't think I could. The, the scene with him and Sean Penn is Probably. outstanding. Yeah. One of the better ones. It, but, I mean, I could probably name three or four others that, that I like maybe as much. Hmm. And, and that's a good thing. Well, I thought that was my favorite part of the movie because that's what it was building up to. But there are one or two other like moments, I think, some really, really good shots. But that whole scene, I think, is quite powerful, actually, mm-hmm. to the true measure of the story. I'd say it's no contest, in all honesty. I, I feel like in that whole scene, you get the entire point of the movie in about a three-minute clip. But it doesn't really bog you over the head. And no, it, it doesn't feel preachy. It just feels real and natural, mm-hmm. which is what's what makes it such a great scene. Mm-hmm. In contrast of some of, the other, some of the other points where it's a little heavy-handed, some of the spectacle goes a little out of control at times. That's but. the stuff that bothered me a yeah, little bit. Yeah, but I mean, just like the, the scene where he's with his family mm-hmm. right before he sort of goes off to uh, to find Sean, you know, with his mom and his sister just at the house there, just kind of all talking uh, about life and about him zoning out. And I-, I think that's a really good scene as well. A little on the nose, but provides enough subtext. Personally, I think that's more natural than, you know, literally having on, like, the sidewalk saying, go and live your dreams. Like, <laughs> no. right, that's right. a little too obvious. Right. I, th- I think that bogs down the movie. The movie's smarter than that. Mm-hmm. It doesn't yeah. need that constantly. Like, once in a while is cute, but I think there are some sequences for the transitions that are a little, a little heavy-handed. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to say on the nose, Justin, I do feel like there's definitely bigger examples of that in this film. Oh, no, I'm not denying you that. You know? Yeah. But um, I'm glad we all got the chance to watch it again. For me, you know, I feel like this is going to be a, a new perennial. I, I can watch this probably every year. It is a shame, though, that it isn't talked about as much. Yeah, it really is. I, I, it sort of got, you know, the, the short shrift last year. I don't think people knew what to make of it. I can, I can understand you know? that. It's, mm-hmm. it's a very unique movie, and you don't really see those kind of family adventure movies like that anymore. No. Right. It's something that would have been more in place in the 90s. Yeah, like a Jumanji or yeah. <laughs> you know, something like that. Actually, yes. Uh, and maybe even a little more basic than that, to be honest. Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, they actually made family films that weren't as fantastical. They were just real stories that everyone could watch. Yeah. And it's you're right, Justin. It's rare. So it's, mm-hmm. it's definitely something we're not used to these days. Um, well, up next we have our old classic. This was a uh, listener's choice from listener Melissa, so we thank you for this. We uh, put the call out for a Christmassy film, and we got uh, the classic Christmas in Connecticut. And Justin's going to talk about it. Elizabeth Lane, played by Barbara Stanwyck, has been well regarded as one of the country's best food writers when, when in reality it's all a sham. And all her knowledge of food comes from her talented friend Felix, played by S.C. Seikal. However, when her boss, played by Sidney Greenstreet, decides to come to her, quote, farm for Christmas with a war hero, Dennis Morgan, Elizabeth starts to do whatever she can to keep up with appearances and save her career. Needless to say, this begs for farce and corny moments, but I gotta say, it's a pretty fun ride, although it's mostly predictable. Some scenes lend themselves to unforgettably hilarious moments, the pancake scene is great, and then there are others that just become comedic overkill. With many of them just being, oh, let's go eat again. We get it. <laughs> Toby like to eat. <laughs> Toby we like it. to eat As we like a to lot. Say, fat man is fat. Ha ha. Yeah. Fat man is fat until the point of like, oh, I can out eat you. I'm so fat. Oh my. But fortunately, the entire cast is game for, for this film. And every, just about everyone gets at least one good entertaining line to keep it lively. It's definitely not the best Christmas movie I've ever, I've ever seen. But it certainly has its place as being a fun fluffy film that everyone can sit around and watch and have a good time with. I give it a B. I think that there is a good reason this movie is regarded as a holiday classic. I I had never seen it, always heard about it. Um, it, It's got this incredibly silly premise, as most farces do, but the actors shine their way through even the goofiest of characters and wacky lines, most notably Stanwyck. 
The way the film deals with gender stereotypes and also the corporate world is pretty sharp, and having been released just weeks before the end of World War II, I am sure the themes of, you know, women in the kitchen, etc. were even more prevalent at the time. Uh, it's not without flaws, certainly. It gets a little sentimental and hokey at times, uh, as most Christmas films do, or romance films of the era do, uh, but it could certainly be much worse, and I give it a B+. Plus. Uh, Joe? Uh, Christmas in Connecticut. I don't know if I'd really say it's necessarily one of the greats. I've certainly seen better Christmas movies, but I did actually like the premise for the plot. I think that there was some good commentary here. I actually like movies, especially older ones, that kind of push the envelope. And I think in regards to just, you know, consumerism and pushing stereotypes for gender roles and things like that, I think there was some good stuff here. Uh, unfortunately, the main plot with the romance and some of the far stuff is extremely predictable, as you guys mentioned, and repetitive, and it does get hokey and sentimental. But I really liked a lot of the characters in the movie. I think the actors managed to bring them to life for the most part does get a bit repetitive at points, but on the whole, it's still pretty enjoyable. I did like the conclusion. Maybe if it had been a little bit shorter, perhaps it would have been better. I'm going to leave it with a B. Yeah, I could have trimmed maybe 10, 15 minutes off it, tighten it up a little bit. They, they did kind of just repeat some of the same scenarios a few times, especially yeah. at the end. Mm -hmm. They did. But, you know, surprisingly, for, uh, for the era, this maid character they have was not really that racist. No, she wasn't. Which was surprising. No, you're right. In the age of Tom and Jerry and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, she was obviously like Latina, Mexican, don't know exactly, but they they really could have played that up, and, mm -hmm. and they didn't, That's which good. is rare, I think, to no, see in a movie this no, old. No, I think that there there was some, some clever stuff here. I think these people were fairly enlightened. I mean, it's obvious by some of the... The sexual undertones and devil entendres mm. there. This movie is a bit racy at points. It's it's a little ahead of its time, I think. Yeah, it gets a little tongue-in-cheek at times. I actually am glad that you mentioned that because they're showing these these foreign characters and letting them shine. Mm -hmm. Not uh, not letting them become stereotypes or just flat-out caricatures. I don't know. I thought that it was bordering on stereotypical at some points. A little bit, but some points. compared to a lot of the other films, I mean, especially, I mean, World War II is still going on. You look at a movie... Like well, it's no Stromboli, <laughs> yeah, Stromboli, no, no. or you know, I mean, we've definitely seen a lot worse um, from around this time. No, I enough said. Yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> we, we've seen some examples, but you know, yeah. it's it's just a fun stereotype, but it's nothing really, I guess, harmful. No, no. I, I really like Barbara Stanwyck's performance in this. I don't think I've ever seen her in anything. I know the name, obviously. Yep. She's a classic. Yeah, the name sounds really familiar, but I probably well, yeah. I mean, she's movie. one of the old, you know, Hollywood screen sirens, right? Um, but I, I don't think I'd ever seen her or anything, and and she was very good here. Uh, well, finally, we have uh, another classic here. This is uh, from 1960. It is our Oscar A to Z film, and it's The Apartment. This was nominated for ten Oscars, and it won five of them including some biggies, Best Picture, Best Director, and Original Screenplay, and some of the other uh, things it was nominated for include Best Actor, Actress, and Supporting Actor as well. Hot off the heels of his Some Like It Hot, Billy Wilder directed, produced, and co-wrote The Apartment, which sees C.C. Bud Baxter, played by Jack Lemmon, as a lowly insurance office worker who allows his superiors to borrow his apartment night after night so they can conduct their extramarital affairs, in the hopes that he will move up the corporate ladder as a result. Soon, the personnel director of the company, Mr. Sheldrake, played by Fred McMurray, one of my favorites, hears about this and wants to use the apartment as well. Unfortunately, he wants to use it with the girl that Bud has his eye on, an elevator operator at the building, played by Shirley MacLaine. I honestly don't believe that a movie like this could win Best Picture with today's Academy. The last comedy to win it was nearly 20 years ago, Shakespeare in Love, and in some years, no comedies are even nominated for Best Picture. That may be due to the perception of romance films today, but when you look at The Apartment, its main characters are well-defined, well-written, and realistic. The situations, of course, are a little out there at times, not to mention some of the side characters are a little bit silly, and talk about a stereotype, the great Jewish doctor neighbor, oh my. who we all loved, but uh, is a little bit uh, stereotypical. McLean and Lemon, though, have great chemistry and are in top form here. The apartment has a crackling script and holds interest from start to finish, something very few rom-coms can actually do these days, so maybe the Academy is onto something. I don't know. I give it an A. Justin? 
Well, for me, with Billy Wilder, at least for his classic seven-year itch, The Apartment, I believe Stalag 17, I might be wrong about that, the man just covers these timeless themes, and they hold up remarkably well, and I think The Apartment is probably one of his crowning achievements. He tells a really contained, very relevant story, and it just really comes together in these smart, clever ways that allow comedy to flow freely, but also not underplay the drama in them as well. He allows every character to really breathe. Jack Lemmon gives a fantastic performance. Shirley McLean, who could have easily let her character descend into this annoying one-dimensional character, becomes really multi-layered, and we honestly do feel for her dilemma. And it ultimately lends itself to becoming a classic in every sense of the word, adding in some really smart humor at times, and just having a genuine heart. And who am I to argue its its rank is one of the greatest films ever made? I give it an A+. Hmm. Joe, what would you think of The Apartment? Well... I like it when the Oscars actually are on to something. <laughs> so sometimes I, I find some of their decisions questionable. But this movie was nominated for just about everything, and it, it really had a bit of reputation. Uh, I haven't seen Jack Lemmon in, in uh, many of his earlier films. I think most of his repertoire I've seen about 30 years after this <laughs> film was made. But really, I do think the guy's a great actor, and he gives probably his best performance I've seen him here. And uh, really, McLean does great as well. I haven't seen mm-hmm. much of her early stuff either, but... Even back then, she just did a great job. They have great chemistry. The film really does touch on a lot of really timeless ideas. I think it was probably really relevant at the time. I mean, that fear of kind of being swept up in the corporate idea of consumerism and kind of that post-industrial idea, the you know darker nature of the American dream, how far are you willing to go? But it also really does bring these really human characters really down to earth, really complex, and the actors just portray them with such subtlety. It's quite amazing. And Really, it it has a lot of great dramatic components, but really peppered with some great comedy throughout. Uh, I didn't really think of it as a, a rom com, but it's really a high standard to meet. I, I wish uh, yeah. that more, you know, films in the genre would actually try to aspire to this instead of being really shallow and cliche and just really quite bad, to be quite honest. But really, this movie is quite excellent. I do agree. Some of the some of the scenarios are a bit silly, and some of the stereotypes are there. But I think that all the characters really do work for the most part. And the story, for the most part, does flow. I do think it runs on a little long. It it does border a little bit on repetitive, I think, maybe the last five, ten minutes. But overall, though, very enjoyable. And definitely earns its place as a classic. I give it an A. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is my parents' all-time favorite movie, so it had a lot to live up to for me. I had never seen it uh, in full. Um, So it's good to actually see it, you know, completely. I would say Silver Linings Playbook is probably the closest to this type of this standard of a rom-com that that we're gonna see for a long time because yeah i'd say it's fair i I mean honestly you hit it joe you know and and i said it as well i mean the the romantic comedies we get these days and i like some of them but they're just this is on a whole nother plane well it's an actual film you know it's aspiring to be Mm -hmm. a movie first and not a genre that's true you know i mean you you have something that fills a slot i mean I think of something like, honestly, something Matthew McConaughey would have done 10 years ago, like yeah, How to Lose a Guy in 10 to, Days. Right. Just, just follow a simple formula. Yeah, formula. just a throwaway kind of movie. It's basically just there. It's just, it's just an empty template, more or less, fill in the blanks, there you go. But you have a story that, like, you think of The Apartment or Silver Linings Playbook, I don't think of them as rom-coms. I don't. Okay. That really, and but they are, and that really just exceeds the drama. It technically is, but it shows that you don't have to be limited to just some label. But, I mean, a lot of the movies that we've seen this year that are great are basically hybrids of a lot of different genres. I mean, we talked when I brought up Birdman as my number one drama of the last five years. Yes, it's a drama, but also has comedic elements. Obviously, top five we just talked about a little while ago. There's there's definitely a lot of these, and I think that really is a testament to just really great, strong writing. Mm-hmm. Being able to throw in all these different elements and not really let it become restricted. But I think that's the stigma that rom-coms have. Like, you look at a movie like Friends with Kids, which we all really enjoyed. It did nothing at the box office because I think people see, you know, oh, a guy and a girl being, you know, pithy and in funny situations. Mm -hmm. And it has this stigma attached to it because of a lot of these, you know, McConaughey and uh, Hugh Grant type of films. True. Well, because we have so many throwaways now. Yeah. I think it's just a testament to the fact that people as a whole are producing way too many movies and we're not focusing on them enough. Mm-hmm. Just want to pump them out. 
Yeah. That's yeah. a big problem with cinema these days, I agree. That is true. But th- this really is a cut above the rest for sure. Absolutely. Um, I-, I can't imagine I've seen a whole lot of other movies from 1960, but, I mean, I'm sure this deserved to win, <laughs> you know, Best Picture for uh, for the time. And uh, a second Shirley MacLaine role this week. She plays uh, Walter Mitty's mother, so yeah. that's uh, always good to see, you know, the, the same great actor or actress 50-some years apart yeah. still doing it. Mm-hmm. All right, well, uh, a good uh, way to wrap up the show. We don't always get those with the Oscar slot. Got lucky this time. <laughs> we did. We got very lucky. Uh, and I mentioned this last week on the show. The next couple weeks we'll have uh, some real good ones coming up. Um, so we'll look forward to all of that. Um, Joe, you got uh, any year-end stuff uh, coming up on the Merlin channel? Oh, well, I'm probably going to do um, a review with everybody, a big group review in the car, probably after we see The Hobbit tomorrow. So that should okay. be up within the next day or two. And I did hit a thousand subscribers, so oh, congrats. I'll probably be doing a couple well videos. Done, <laughs> Thank you. I'll probably be doing a couple videos to celebrate that. Maybe some top tens, uh, probably some QAs, maybe a live stream. So, and then I'll be reformatting and uh, hitting it a lot harder next year. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, some good things definitely coming. Yeah, and uh, speaking of year end stuff, we're gonna have our year end show uh, in about two weeks time, uh, giving you the best and the worst of 2014. Uh, and we just reached uh, 50 subscribers not too long ago here. Uh, so we thank everybody that's uh, been on board for that. And if you haven't yet, uh, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, tell a friend as well if you think they would enjoy the show. You can also hit us on the Facebook group, which is Film Fanatics with an exclamation point, And our Twitter feed is at Film Fanatics Pod. Both of those places uh, not only will have the links to our shows, but our five-word reviews weekly. That is going to do it for us, and uh, thanks so much for listening. We'll see you back here next week. Tubby's got to eat.